an unprecedented journey to the front lines of an environmental catastrophe. What happens in the Amazon doesn't just stay in the Amazon. A crisis driven by the thirst for gold. It represents God, wealth, success, kings. An award-winning NBC News investigative team goes deep inside the Amazon to tell a story that affects everyone on the planet. We are going to see the devastation caused by illegal mining. Not only an environmental disaster, but a threat to U.S. national security as well. It's hard to believe, but the desert behind me was a vibrant rainforest a decade ago. It's called La Pampa, the epicenter of illegal mining, stripped of everything that made it a rainforest. Those pools of water are toxic. A place once vital for absorbing the world's carbon is now pumping ever more carbon into the atmosphere. Why has this happened, and what are the consequences? For the first time since the pandemic, Peruvian special forces take our network news team inside the emergency zone to see the full extent of what has been lost. NBC is the first network news team since the pandemic to be allowed inside this emergency zone. We are going to see the devastation caused by illegal mining. It's taken producers Lisa Cavazzuti and Kevin Monaghan nearly a year of preparation to get us here. Photographer Bill Angelucci joins the team straight from covering the war in Ukraine. Despite all the planning, we are still shocked to see the utter destruction here. A protected, old-growth rainforest which now looks like this. Desert, interrupted by toxic ponds of mercury. What happens in the Amazon doesn't just stay in the Amazon. And, 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 and that is why two of the, of the world's water. foremost Amazon scientists... But the legumes are really important in the story because they put nitrogen back in the soil. Luis Fernandez and Miles Silman, both American professors, have agreed to be our guides. I'm studying tropical forest ecosystems and how they respond to climate change. And Luis? I don't study the same kind of pretty places that Miles does. I study areas that have been destroyed and degraded, then figure out how to stop it from happening again. Yeah, your sunshine, your darkness, essentially. <laughs> essentially. Yeah. The destruction here is accelerated in the past dozen years. It is now affecting worldwide weather patterns, crop growth, and carbon emissions. How bad is it? It's pretty bad. It's much worse than we had feared why? Because of a massive gold rush and a highway. First, the gold rush. After the collapse of the housing market in 2008, the price of gold shot up from $900 an ounce to what is now around $1,800 an ounce. One U.S. official told us at least $3 billion worth of unaccounted for gold out of Peru every year, much of it headed to the U.S. As for the highway... A couple of years after the market crash, the 1,600-mile Trans-Oceanic Highway, connecting Peru's once isolated forest to the rest of the world, was completed. There's almost a maxim. When you build a highway through a rainforest, bad things happen. And bad things did happen. The highway allowed heavy mining machinery to access remote and protected forests. The highway also made the trafficking of children easier. An astounding 50,000 children since 2010, according to the UN's International Labor Organization. Young boys for cheap labor, and young girls for cheap sex, all to satisfy the lust for gold. The thirst for gold knows no bounds. Since antiquity, it was the ultimate metal. It represents God, wealth, success, kings. Little wonder an area so rich in this most exalted mineral is known as Madre de Dios, Mother of God. The ground bursts with flecks of 24 karat gold. And that is why so many who have so little have been drawn here to mine it. They work around the clock. This miner tells us he works two shifts a day. Which brings us back to what happened at that first site we visited, La Pampa, a remote protected corner of the Madre de Dios region, 
La Pampa is the largest illegal artisanal mining gold field in the Amazon. It is kind of the emblem of environmental destruction from gold mining in the world. So what does the actual mining look like? To collect an ounce of gold, you must separate it from nearly 30 tons of silt. Miners working under very difficult conditions using really primitive techniques have to somehow sift through tons of sediment to get those little flecks of gold. The rich black silt is pumped out of a pit where the trees have been chopped down, and it's flush with water down a slide. But where's the gold? To get that final step, where you want to separate the gold from the sand, you add mercury. Mercury is poison, isn't it? It is. It's poisonous to humans, to wildlife. It lasts for centuries. All the mercury that is spreading. Some of it touches the gold, but a lot of it doesn't. The rest of it is thrown back into the river, kind of like the baby with the bath water, except that the baby is toxic. And so now are the fish. Studies show some of the fish here are contaminated with the highest levels of mercury than anywhere else in the Amazon, way beyond safe levels. In the mining region, at least 78% of the people have mercury levels beyond the recommendations of the World Health Organization. For children, it is particularly dangerous. Luis explains how the mercury spreads. Let's imagine this pond, and there's a certain level of mercury. Maybe there's a little fish, and then there's a bigger fish, and a bigger fish. You can just see that little diagram of the big fish eating the other ones. And at the end of that chain is a fisherman who feeds his children. The level of mercury in that fish can be more than a million or 10 million times higher than the concentration in the water. The real danger of mercury is that it magnifies as it goes from one animal that eats the other, times 10, every step, until it gets to you. And mercury doesn't stay put in the mining region. 180 miles upstream from where the mining's happening, Miles and Luis have discovered that 98% of an indigenous group have mercury levels that exceed safe levels this new research just published. The destruction extends throughout the Amazon. In total, well over a million acres have been affected, turning a place once vital for absorbing the world's carbon into one pumping carbon into the atmosphere. The first meter of soil in the forest holds as much carbon as all the trees that are above it. And then when we think about the next meter, two meters, three meters, four meters, there can be a whole other forest's worth of carbon down that deep. Are you suggesting that if we dig down there, we may be releasing all of this old carbon into the atmosphere? Not suggesting. We really are. It's something that needs a lot more study. It's something that we're, we're, we're just starting to, to work out. In 2010, satellite images alerted authorities something strange was happening in the forest. And by 2019, the government stepped in, launching Operation Mercury. Victoria! The police, working with special forces, drove at least 20,000 miners out of the region, along with 5,000 others running the shops, bars, and brothels that supported them. This is just the beginning of a massive destruction. That's right. This is how unscrupulous people turn this beautiful paradise into a deserted area. General Jaime Bianchi now commands the special forces here. Permiso, mi general. Guardia de la base temporal mixta de alta movilidad alfa. Three years after driving the miners out, the military remains, he tells us, to make sure the miners don't return. We travel with him to one of the military's four bases in La Pampa, an area still designated as in a state of emergency. General Bianchi tells us they feel they have the situation under control, but they do have orders to stay another five years. Was Operation Mercury a success? Yes. The objective was to remove the miners who were in this sector, and we did it. It is in some ways, though, a game of cat and mouse. Can you win? See, Yes. We believe that it's possible to recover the territory, to change the mentality of the people through education. But just two months after we visited, miners attacked one of the military bases here at La Pampa reportedly killing one soldier 
Sources shared these videos of the protests exclusively with NBC News. So the situation is tense, perhaps because of who is funding much of the mining and profiting from it. Paramilitary cartels, which have joined forces across borders, as the general alluded to when we asked if the miners fought back during Operation Mercury. Was there much resistance? There wasn't much resistance. They avoid being captured, so they won't be linked to the investigation of those who finance this. These are sophisticated and ruthless organizations. As a U.S. State Department official testified before Congress, noting that these transnational criminal organizations are making billions, in some cases doubling what they made from selling drugs by selling illicit gold and laundering cash. Poor miners don't have access to the formal banking system, so the cartels are their bankers, paying for machinery and laundering the money involved. Their massive profits funding their own militaries with jets. The cartel's work made easier because, unlike drugs, gold is a legal product and easy to move around. For example, the U.S. has no quota on how much raw gold you can bring into the country. The same routes that are used to transport cocaine are used to move illegal gold, mercury, and human beings. And there is yet another wild twist. Mining with mercury is legal in Peru. That's right, it is legal. But it can only be done on land the government has sanctioned. But as so-called government concessions are expensive, many miners have covertly set up shop in prohibited areas like La Pampa. But consider the irony. La Pampa is protected, but just across the highway, mining with mercury is legal, and yet the same destruction is underway. But despite it all, Luis and Miles and many others believe it is not too late to save this place. What can be done and who is putting their lives at risk to do it when we return? There is much at stake in the Peruvian Amazon for the health of the planet, for the people who live there. Some cartels and paramilitary groups are making more money now from illegal gold than from drugs. Their resource is vast. Little wonder the U.S. State Department calls it a threat to U.S. national security, all part of the reason the U.S. military has become involved, providing real-time intelligence to Peruvian forces. No! 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 Those U.S. military sources tell us the Peruvians are doing their best battling these cartels with roots, not just in Peru, but also Venezuela, Brazil, and Ecuador. Some have made so much money, they're now buying jets to more efficiently transport their illicit goods and then burning them so their roots are undetected. We are facing very serious threats. Mariano Castro is Peru's former vice minister of the environment. He resigned earlier this year. So our sources in the U.S. government say that transnational criminal organizations are profiting at the highest levels from this gold mining, buying armies, essentially creating their own armies. True? Yes, and not only that, but they're also generating local corruption. Before stepping down, Castro represented Peru in a deal with over 120 other countries, including the U.S., to significantly reduce the use of mercury for mining. Though there is currently no hard deadline, most of those we talk to worry it will not be effective. And so the multi-billion dollar operations rage on, and the people fighting back are increasingly under threat. Oh, paradise. We visit the home of one of Peru's fiercest environmental defenders, 75-year-old Victor Zambrano his land, now a private reserve. Is it true that you personally have planted 20,000 trees? Yes. 30,000, and I keep planting them. The recipient of many prestigious international awards, including a National Geographic grant, just days before we arrived, he tells us two men with silencers came to do him harm, but were scared off by a neighbor who saw them and screamed. With him, the day we visit is Demetrio Pacheco, 
who knows only too well what the cost of protecting the land from the miners can mean. This is very dangerous work you're doing. In my case, I have already suffered the death of one of my children. After several threats, his son, Roberto, who was shot to death on land, he and his father refused to allow miners to operate on. I have a son. I can't imagine what this must have been like for you. You found him. It was a very sad and fatal moment for me to have him so robust, so happy, and that to find him lying there on the road. 34-year-old Roberto was one of the 14 environmental activists in Peru who have been killed in the last two years. The government, they tell us, has not been helpful to them. Pacheco tells us despite being identified, the suspects in his son's murder remain fugitives. It's sort of open season on environmental defenders. At this point in our lives, we don't have the choice. What might happen to us does not matter. Fueling the illicit mining, which U.S. government officials tell us results in at least $3 billion worth of unaccounted for gold making its way into the worldwide market, are ruthless transnational organizations, cartels, paramilitary groups, some of whom are now making more from gold than from drugs. Zimbrano says the criminal groups are so powerful and government corruption is so rampant, it is difficult to bring the situation under control. We are evil to them. We are the enemy. We are the obstacle for their illegal purposes. The men tell us they now technically have government protection, but call it meaningless. A piece of paper against a bullet? What use is this paper? The paper doesn't stop a bullet. The state has not provided this for us. They have not activated security systems for him, for me, or for any of the environmental defenders in their corresponding zones. Zambrano tells us he's been offered a quarter of a million dollars to stay quiet. You're just two men on the front lines of what seems like a war financed by some very powerful people. Can you win? That's what we hope for, to not falter, because the forest is a benefit to mankind as a whole. It is not just for us. I, I don't know if you're brave or foolish. You may call us insane, crazy, but this is our conviction, and nobody will change it. We met another man who's also on the front lines in yet another battle the trafficking of human beings. Oscar Guadalupe has been rescuing children for 20 years and has seen the problem get worse as gold became more precious. We always say that children are the future of the country. The future is right now. It's the present. It's those children who are suffering now. They have to be looked after right now. Often the children of desperately poor parents who unwittingly become part of this tragic supply chain. Are some of the children who end up here in mining communities, are some of them trafficked, sold by parents? Yes, but they are deceived. Parents receive money for the children's work, but they never tell them what the children will work on here. Work for the boys in the mines? and for the girls in the brothels and prosty bars like these. Oscar, who says he's saved more than 1,000 kids over the years, tells us he has brought many to his own home as a way station. Do you remember the first young girl who you rescued? Uh, it's very hard. She was a 13-year-old girl. She had been abused by a group of workers, brutally abused. But as is often the case, the men were never brought to justice. It's, emo it's so emotional for you. Yes, it's okay. We feel we haven't done anything. 
Do you feel you haven't done anything when you remember her? And other cases, too. And it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Diana Valencia, a prosecutor for Peru's Office of Human Trafficking, is fighting back as well, trying to bring traffickers to justice, but often feels outgunned. It sounds like the traffickers have more resources than you do. Yes, ironically, they win in everything. They have better weapons than the police. And vastly more money. You think the defense is funded by gold? Yes, because there are owners of these bars and nightclubs who are relatives of people in the mining activity. And it's all related. You're very brave. You're brave. Because she and others like her are not just fighting the criminals, but also, far too often, corrupt officials. According to the most recent State Department report on human trafficking, corruption at all levels of the Peruvian law enforcement and criminal justice systems hampers efforts to hold traffickers accountable. How many women are trafficked uh, in the area? Well, there are hundreds of women from different parts of the country. Transnational crime in regards to human trafficking, that is what we deal with here. General Ulysses Chavez is head of intelligence for the Peruvian National Police. He says he will not tolerate corruption in his ranks. He has an anti-trafficking unit at his disposal, but he says even that is not enough. In some ways, it's, it's an unfair fight. I mean, there was massive amounts of money backing the criminals. Organizations formed around human trafficking not only sexually exploit people, but they also diversify their crime towards extortion. Despite all of the challenges, Luis and Miles say it is not too late to save this place. They take us on a tour to show us some ideas for the future. First, we meet Don Pedro, one of the first miners to stop using mercury. Instead, he uses this table, which literally shakes the gold free. That's the gold. This takes forever. He tells us his workers don't like this much slower process as their wages depend on how much gold they produce. But if the tables could be made bigger and the process streamlined, the scientists say it might make a difference. Five hours away, another bold experiment in the works. The Harak Boot people, a 300-person indigenous community, has spent a million dollars developing an eco-lodge, not yet open. The setting, breathtaking. It's mind-blowing, the diversity that you find. If we walked out in the forest, there would be as many breeding birds in the, say, square mile as there are in all of North America. There would be a thousand species of butterflies, maybe more. But even here, we're shocked to discover they are mining with mercury to fund the eco-lodge, and the hopes mining will one day be unnecessary. As the president of the community, Yasmina Loraiko, tells us. Do you hope for a day when mining is no longer necessary here and that tourism will be enough to sustain your people? Yes, definitely. That's our goal. Meanwhile, Miles and Luis's work is deemed critical by the Peruvian government, which partners with them. This is the first and only mercury research lab in the Peruvian Amazon. They created a nonprofit, Cincia, which the U.S. and NASA also help fund. What is this we're climbing up? Yeah, it's a big pile of rocks left over by gold mining. We're making our way to part of the largest reforestation operation in the Americas. How great! Where they study what might grow in these mining pits. You have to have the right tree for the right place, right? Yeah, you can spend a whole lot of effort and just send the little trees to their death sentences. You're standing in a mining site. This was all mining. Another kind of experiment is taking place in the lab behind Miles and Luis's mercury lab funded by the Peruvian government and led by Peruvian researchers. Okay. I got him. I got him. I got him. Yes, right here. As catfish, one of the most popular fish here, are increasingly contaminated by mercury, the Peruvians are attempting to raise mercury-free fish in these tanks. This is the first time that this species is being cultivated because it's the first time that it's been reproduced in Peru. So far, they're doing well. 
I attempt to help with the weighing. Okay. 11. Yep. Science is very difficult. And finally, Luis introduces us to a group of kids they're working with. We're here with students to measure mercury to see if these rivers and streams are polluted by illegal gold mining. Insects the students collect will be studied by Cynthia scientists. It's really important to get the kids involved because these kids are the ones that are going to have to deal with this problem in the future. One day, what do you want to look back and say, yeah, we did that? I'd love to see a generation of Peruvian scientists solving their problems to pass the torch forward. I got a little choked up thinking, just thinking about that. I think what give me the most joy looking back is that like, we were on a team and we, we tried. We tried to do something. And I, think, I think we did it, we're doing it, and that's something to remember. This was all desert a few years ago, but with their help and a little push from Mother Nature, it's coming back. Nature always heals itself. It just uh, depends on how long it takes. Well, if we don't mess it up too much. The problem with talking to a biologist is I'm thinking nature heals itself on the scales of, like, asteroids killing dinosaurs and okay. things like that. Yeah, sorry. Right. <laughs> Keep going. Realizing that the Amazon doesn't have that kind of time, the battle to save it continues as the destruction rages on. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.